Right, I want to start this lecture by apologizing for my voice. I've um, got a bit of a cold, as you'll find out uh, next time we meet in class. But um, if I cough into the microphone here, my apologies. I'll try to pause before that happens. We're going to finish up Chapter 15. This is uh, Part 2 of that lecture series. And instead of intracellular compartments, we're going to move on to intracellular transport. This is pages 510 to 526 in the textbook. We'll talk first about transport vesicles and how they carry around all soluble things, soluble proteins specifically. But we're moving away from this idea of threading or carrying proteins into organelles like the nucleus and the ER. And and instead vesicles, membrane-bound vesicles, carrying proteins around the rest of the endomembrane system. In that discussion, we'll talk about a protein called cath clathrin, and how clathrin forms a cage or a, sh a shell around transport vesicles, the importance of that. We'll talk about vesicle docking, how the vesicle arrives at its target organelle, and, and what allows it to stick there. We'll go back to the ER, but this time we're going to talk about some of the modifications that occur to proteins in the ER. And once those proteins are moved to the Golgi, what modifications happen in the Golgi as well? So what are the differences between protein processing in these two organelles? And then we'll end with a fairly brief, but hopefully somewhat thorough, explanation of exocytosis and endocytosis, uh, the two ways that membranes leave and enter the cell from the outside environment, respectively. So we lent, ended our last lecture talking about proteins and cargo getting into a certain uh, small number of organelles. And we ended that lecture by saying, but proteins move in another way as well. Proteins move by vesicle transport as well. And uh, so we really ended the last lecture starting this one, only really starting this idea of transport throughout a single cell. The transport of proteins into the ER lumen or into the ER membrane is something we discussed in the last lecture, but that's only the first step of a very long journey for many proteins. Getting to the ER is step one. From the ER, most proteins go elsewhere. Most of them go next to the Golgi, but that's usually not their final destination either. Many, many of those proteins that trans transfer from the ER to the Golgi continue on their journey and have other destinations from the Golgi as well. So transport throughout this entire system, the endomembrane system, occurs not through direct protein threading or protein translocators on membranes. Instead, this transport is carried out by a continual process of the budding, release, and fusion of transport vesicles. Transport vesicles are membrane-bound bubbles, really, membrane-bound bubbles that contain within them cargo. And these vesicles move in two general directions. They move from the ER to the Golgi, and then beyond to either other cellular regions or the cell membrane. Or they move from the cell membrane inward, usually to lysosomes. So the two main directions of vesicles is from the ER outward to the Golgi and then other destinations in the cell. Or from the cellular membrane first to lysosomes and then when those intaken, in, <laughs> intaken, when those intaked molecules have arrived at a lysosome and they're digested, uh, those building blocks, those nutrient molecules, are then released to the rest of the cell. So these two directions really originate from the nucleus and go all the way out of the cell, or come in from the cell and then uh, distribute through the cytoplasm. These two directions provide routes of communication within and throughout a cell. So today in this lecture we're going to discuss how vesicles, one, know where their destination is and how they get to those destinations. And this is in both directions. The from synthesis in the cell outward, secretion, or from outside of the cell inward, consumption. And so this is called the eat and secrete pathways. Eating coming from outside in and secretion going from inside out. So the main role of transport vesicles is to carry things that are soluble, carry things that are hydrophilic, and things that won't easily uh, diffuse across a cell membrane. So when we say soluble proteins and soluble membranes, we mean hydrophilic. We mean things that are water-soluble, that are polar, that are not hydrophobic and therefore not happy in membranes. Vesicle transport between organelles, specifically organelles of the endomembrane system, is very, very choreographed. This is a highly regulated pathway which moves hydrophilic things around the cell. One example of such a transport pathway is the secretory pathway. This is the secrete 
part of eat and secrete. This is getting things from inside the cell to outward. This is making something in the ER, moving it to the Golgi, and then eventually getting it to the cell membrane and released into the exterior portion of the cell, the extracellular space. This transport pathway is used to get biomolecules out of the cell, to get those biomolecules secreted, released into the extracellular space. It usually starts with the synthesis of a protein or even a lipid molecule at the ER. That molecule is made at and then sent through the ER membrane. It's then transported to the Golgi where it's modified and from the Golgi it eventually makes it out of the cell for secretion. Another example of such a transport pathway is the endocytic pathway. Here is the eating part of the eat and secrete mechanisms. This is where extracellular molecules are brought into the cell, degraded by the lysosome, and then those degraded, broken down bits of nutritious molecules are released from the lysosome into the rest of the cell where they can be used for cellular energy or cellular processes. This pathway is also used to recycle broken parts of the cell. So any component of the cell that is faulty, that is aged, that is no longer working properly can also be degraded in the lysosome down to its basic building blocks and then those building blocks recycled by cellular processes. So everything we're describing here sounds pretty straightforward and simple, but it's actually very, very complicated. Think about it for a second. Every time a vesicle buds off of an organelle, say off of the Golgi, but any organelle, it must take in it, it must carry only the proteins that are supposed to be in that vesicle and nothing else. Keep in mind there are plenty of proteins in the endoplasmic reticulum that belong in the endoplasmic reticulum that should not be shipped off into some vesicle because that protein's home is the ER. How do we keep those proteins out of these vesicles and make sure that only the cargo we want to be shipping is in the vesicle? You don't want to ship endoplasmic reticular proteins away from the ER. So that's challenge one. Second challenge is that vesicles need to somehow be specifically sent to their proper destination. How does that happen? There are so many different places to go in a cell, so many different organelles to fuse with. How does a particular vesicle only go to its proper destination? You don't want to take a vesicle full of proteins that are intended for the Golgi and instead send them to the cellular membrane where they would be secreted into the extracellular space. So we have a system here where organelles of the endomembrane system, or the endomembrane group, are constantly trading components one another. There's a constant flow of molecules from the ER to the Golgi, from the Golgi to the cell membrane, from the Golgi back to the ER. So all these things are trading membranes and trading molecules, yet somehow, in the middle of all this, each of these endomembrane organelles are maintaining their own unique identity and composition. How is that possible? You would think with so much trading going on that everything would just kind of blend into a homogeneous mixture where the ER would be mostly ER but some Golgi and the Golgi would be some Golgi, some, some cell membrane and all of these things would mix, but they don't. They remain unique. How is that possible? Well, it's possible through a very high level of choreography and, and cellular regulation. Vesicle recognition, knowing where a vesicle came from and what it contains, and vesicle routing, getting it to where it's supposed to go, depends on proteins, specifically proteins that are embedded in the vesicle membrane. So vesicles are dedicated. They are specified and dedicated to carry specific cargo and go to a specific place, and that dedication means that that vesicle can only go to that desired location. So kind of like a shipping label then, right? Well, no, not like a shipping label, because keep in mind as well that a vesicle is itself a cargo holder. So a vesicle isn't like a shipping label, because a shipping label is simply the instructions of where to bring the goods. The vesicle is the empty container that is loaded with the appropriate cargo, and then that container is sent to the proper location. So I prefer the analogy of these cool air tubes. I don't know if you've seen these at the bank or sometimes big libraries have them. Uh, I forget what these, they have a 
specific name, like a mnemonic tube or something like that. But uh, these are these cool tubes, a little plastic cylinder, little container there. This one's for a bank in the picture. You open the top, you put your money in, or you put your books in, you put your license in, whatever it needs to go, and then you stick it in the contraption and... The contraption sucks up the tube and sends it exactly where it's supposed to go. The tube is the vesicle, and the system there is the routing system of the cell. So the vesicle goes to its proper location, it's routed to the right person, that person opens it up, takes the cargo out, and then what do they do? They send the vesicle back using the same system, and they send it back empty. And that's how these organelles keep their uniqueness. An ER vesicle with ER membrane goes to its destination. It dumps off its cargo, but eventually that membrane that made up that vesicle is going to go back to the ER because that's where it came from. That's where it belongs. And so there's this constant routing of full vesicles one way and then material going in the opposite direction to get that vesicle back to where it started. Wonderful, wonderful system. So let's talk a little bit about this. How, how do we make this work? So how are vesicles dedicated? How are vesicles unique? How can one vesicle, how can one empty membrane sac be different from another? Well, it starts with proteins, as all things in biology seem to. Most vesicles are covered in a unique, all-encompassing protein coat. It's almost like a cage of protein that forms around the vesicle. These are true ER, uh, I'm, not, I'm sorry, not ER, electron micrographs, pictures from electron microscopes of vesicles. And what you're looking at is actually the protein cage. The membrane is deeper inside this, this structure. We don't see the membrane. And the cargo is in the hollow center of this structure. So you see this protein mesh work, this protein cage around the vesicles. So vesicles are often referred to as coated vesicles. And they are coated with this protein mesh work. These proteins that form the coat or the cage start off by helping the bud to form. They start the vesicle forming at the edge of the organelle. They hold that vesicle in its spherical shape. And those proteins are also specific to the vesicle, so they aid in targeting the vesicle to its appropriate location. And lastly, that protein coat contributes to ensuring that the vesicle is carrying the proper cargo. So all the challenges that we outlined on the first slide just a moment ago are solved primarily by this protein coat. It keeps it in its shape, it routes it to the right place, and it ensures that the cargo is correct. Once the vesicle reaches its proper, its proper target, this protein coat is shed, exposing the membrane. This allows the membrane of the vesicle to touch and fuse with the membrane of the target organelle. And once that fusion occurs, the contents, the cargo of the vesicle, are released into its destination. The best studied vesicle coats are made out of a protein called clathrin. Clathrin coated vesicles usually originate from the Golgi and they're typically destined for secretion, so their fusion point is going to be the cell membrane. Once these vesicles reach the cell membrane, the clathrin coat is shed. The vesicle membrane fuses with the cellular membrane and that is endocytosis. That is, I'm sorry, that is exocytosis. In addition, as we just said for the analogy of those mnemonic tubes, clathrin-coated vesicles also originate from the cell membrane and go back inwards into the cell. So clathrin-coated um, pits or clathrin-coated structures help cellular membrane butt off. And this is endocytosis. This is taking things in from the exterior environment. We're going to talk about both of these structures, both of these pathways today. Uh, we're going to start off talking about how uh, endocytosis works at the cellular membrane, and then we'll go to uh, more of the secretion pathway, and then we'll circle back and end the lecture with some more details on endocytosis. So at the cell membrane, each vesicle starts off as its own clathrin-coated pit. This is a, an invagination. This is a, a pinching of the cellular membrane, causing almost a basket to form on the interior face of the, of the cell. And this basket is held in that shape by clathrin protein. So this is a little bit upside down from my perspective, I think. But uh, what's in gray here is the extracellular space. This is all happening on the interior portion of the cell, the cytosol, cytosolic face here. And you can see that these clathrin proteins in green have adhered to and begun changing the shape of the cellular membrane. They've been pinching the cellular membrane 
in. This creates a divot or a basket or a hole, uh, an impression on the cellular membrane. And anything that was in this region, down here in the extracellular space, has now begun to get trapped in this invagination. <coughs> Excuse me. This is the beginning process for making a vesicle. The clathrin coated pit is, has begun the process of shaping the cell membrane into the shape of a vesicle. The next protein we need is a protein called dy dynamin. Dynamin, as this clathrin coated pit begins to fall and get deeper, dynamin kind of constricts or squeezes off what we call the neck of the vesicle. This squeezing off of the neck of the vesicle closes the vesicle up and keeps the molecules that are inside it trapped. So we have begun pinching off the vesicle from the rest of the membrane. Dynamin continues to constrict and constrict until the cell membrane is brought past its breaking point. Uh, once this breaking point is reached, the vesicle snaps off the cellular membrane. It's now a completely enclosed vesicle made up of membrane, cargo inside, and clathrin coating the outside of that. And all vesicles form this way. Not all vesicles are clathrin coated. Sometimes other proteins help to form the pit. Sometimes other proteins help to constrict the neck. And, and we won't really talk about any of those. We'll mention one briefly in just a moment. But we won't cover any of the others in any detail. So all transport vesicles form in this general way. It's just that not all of them use clathrin. In addition, we've also been led now to how vesicles select their appropriate cargo. Clathrin plays no direct role in the cargo selection. By cargo selection, we mean um, what things are contained within the vesicle, how the cell gets the right things into the vesicle itself. Instead, a third group of proteins called adaptins are important for cargo selection. Adaptins are specific proteins that associate with clathrin-coated vesicles. And adaptins play two roles. They are the connection point between the clathrin protein and the membrane of the vesicle itself. You can see adaptins in light green here, so they are the connecting point between clathrin and the vesicle. But more importantly, adaptins play a role in making sure that the appropriate cargo is loaded into that vesicle. The way that this occurs is through transport signals on the target molecules and receptors for those signals bound to the vesicle. So proteins that are destined for other places, other targets, have transport signals on them. Well, we've covered that idea before. These are just another flavor or another type, type of signal sequence that we've covered in our last lecture. These transport signals are nothing more than a specific sequence of amino acids on the end of the protein. These transport signals bind to what are called cargo receptors. Cargo receptors are membrane-bound proteins that will eventually wind up in the membrane of the vesicle. So here's how it works. You have these cargo receptors in the membrane that we're dealing with. It could be the cell membrane, could be an organelle membrane. These cargo receptors bind specifically to unique transport signals. These transport signals are expressed or found on proteins that don't belong where they are, but instead belong where they're going. So the transport signals on the proteins bind to the cargo receptors. Now your molecule to be shipped is captured by the cargo receptor. The adaptins then capture those receptors and keep them in a specific membrane domain, keep them in a unique position in the membrane. So now your cargo is trapped by the receptors, and the receptors are trapped by adaptin. Now clathrin binds to the adaptin molecules you begin making a clathrin-coated pit in that region. Well, what's in the pit? The adaptins. What are the adaptins bound to? The receptors. What are the receptors holding? Your cargo. The clathrin continues to invaginate and invaginate this membrane until eventually dynamin comes in and squeezes it, squeezes it and pinches it off, and now you have a vesicle. The vesicle is coated with clathrin. The clathrin is bound to the adaptins. The adaptins are still bound to the receptors. The receptors are still bound to the cargo, and now the cargo is in the vesicle. The clathrin, in the coating the, the vesicle, the clathrin itself, is going to route that vesicle to the proper location, bringing with it the cargo that belongs there. So the adaptins help capture those specific cargo molecules. 
indirectly by trapping the receptors and making sure those receptors are below the neck or within the budding vesicle. There are different types of adaptins found in different membranes. Each type of adaptin binds to a specific subset of cargo receptors. So here's where your specificity comes to play. Specific cargo binds to specific receptors, and those receptors are captured by unique adaptins. This is the key to sorting. Cell membrane adaptins bind only to receptors for proteins that belong in the cell membrane. Well, that makes sense. How do we get newly synthesized membrane proteins for the cell to the cellular membrane? Well, we make an adaptin that binds only to those proteins. And that adaptin, along with the clathrin that's going to bind to it, routes that vesicle to the cell membrane. And guess what gets to the cell membrane? Cell membrane proteins. Why? Because the adaptins segregated them there. So when the cell membrane vesicle gets routed to the cell membrane and fuses with the cell membrane, it will contain only cell membrane proteins because these adaptins put them in that vesicle. That's the sorting. Please note that we're just referring to clathrin here and a unique subset of adaptins. This is just an example. This general framework, however, these general concepts apply to all vesicle transport. There's another type of coated vesicle called COP-coated. COP stands for coat protein. COP-coated vesicles transport cargo between the ER and the Golgi and between different structures of the Golgi itself. In fact, we know quite a bit about this, much more than we'll cover here. But to give you a sense of how simple yet elegant it is, clathrin-coated vesicles that contain only the adaptin protein 1, we know those all start at the Golgi, and they go to lysosomes. That's the trigger. Adaptin 1, along with clathrin, targets a vesicle for the lysosome. You can have clathrin along with adaptin protein 2, these are vesicles that start at the plasma membrane and go to endosomes, eventually to lysosomes. The COP proteins that we just referred to, these COP-coated vesicles, start at the ER or the Golgi, and they wind up at the Golgi or the ER, so this is the way that the Golgi and ER transfer cargo between each other. There are others, too, that we won't carry, uh, cover here. We continue to learn more about this every year, it seems. But the proteins that make up the vesicle always do double duty. Capture the appropriate cargo and make sure that vesicle goes to the appropriate destination. And that makes sense. How do you get the right thing to the right place? Have the same exact protein determine what the right cargo is and route that vesicle to the right location. So that's just a taste, really, of how cargo gets captured into appropriate vesicles and how those vesicles get to the appropriate destination. Let's talk a little bit more in a little bit more detail about how vesicles, when they arrive, actually fuse, how they actually stick to and specifically interact with the correct destination. Once a vesicle is formed, it buds from and then is released by its point of origin. The point of origin could be the ER, the Golgi, the cell membrane it finds its way to its correct destination. Once it gets to that correct destination, it must be recognized as having arrived, shed its protein coat, and then fuse the vesicle membrane with the membrane of the target and dump its contents into that target region. The question is, how does this happen? We just discussed the shipping of vesicle cargo. In principle, how we get our writing, our, our, our routing done, we also talked a little bit about how vesicles are actually mechanistically moved when we discussed the cytoskeleton. We talked about these walking proteins, these proteins that had the ability to stick to, adhere to, and walk along microtubules on one end, and on their other end stick to vesicles. So don't forget that. We're coming back to that now, and we'll actually come back to that once again in some detail right near the end of the semester. But when we are moving vesicles, we're moving it in this way. We are taking our walking proteins. Those proteins are walking along microtubules from one part of the cell to the other while simultaneously holding onto coated vesicles, protein-coated vesicles containing cargo to be shipped. In putting the lecture together, I couldn't help but just 
do this because walking proteins walking dead i i'm addicted to this show right now and uh i think there's two more episodes left as of this point oh, that i'm recording this lecture so this has nothing to do with the lecture sorry again we're going to come back to the walking proteins later on in our semester um and give you some more detail about how these things actually move but Suffice it to say for now that vesicles are moved in the cell along microtubules by these walking proteins to get to their final destination. And the question becomes, and then what? Once the vesicle has arrived and reached its target organelle or its target mem membrane, it must recognize that membrane. That membrane must in turn recognize the vesicle. Both structures must be, and forgive me for being a little bit anthropomorphic, but both structures must be satisfied that the other belongs there. And then we have to have docking. The vesicle has to stick. This is true docking. Just as the space shuttle docks to the International Space Station, we want to have our vesicle dock to our target. Docking is different than fusing. The space shuttle can dock with the ISS and still have no transfer of material or human beings across the docking point. The two structures do not have to open to one another for there to be docking. Docking just means that there is a physical connection, a physical interaction, between what was once before two different structures. After docking, sooner or later, there will be membrane fusion, but it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to happen immediately, and certainly docking and membrane fusion are two different processes. So the first thing is the recognition. How does a vesicle recognize that it's arrived at the correct place? And likewise, how does the destination organelle re recognize the vesicle? Back to proteins. Proteins on and in the vesicle membrane give clues as to its origin as well as clue the target organelle into the cargo that is being carried within that vesicle. And we can see even now what we know from this lecture, how that might work. It's all in the adaptants. <coughs> Excuse me. The adaptins tell that that organelle, that target organelle, where the vesicle came from and what it's holding. But it goes further than that. There are specialized proteins on the surface of the vesicle called Rab proteins. And these Rab proteins are almost like molecular or protein signs. And the information that they tell the target is the point of origin where this vesicle came from. So the Rab protein is stuck to and part of the vesicle membrane, and different membranes from different origins have different Rabs. The Rab proteins on the vesicle membrane are recognized and bound by tethering proteins found on the destination membrane. Tethering proteins are specific and unique to only bind to Rabs on vesicles that come from places that should be dumping their cargo off here. Well, let me give you an example. You can almost think as a, of a RAB as a return address, in a way. The RAB tells the target destination membrane where this thing came from. And based on the information in that RAB, based on the identity of that RAB, the destination membrane decides, do I want to be interacting with this or not? So, if the RAB protein says it's from your parents, from your mother, and that's a box that arrives on your doorstep, then that's a cargo that you're willing to interact with. It's a cargo you're willing to open. That's cargo that you're probably interested in having. Because you're familiar with and you trust the point of origin. If the tethering protein recognizes the RAB, it, the, ra the recognition itself tells the target organelle, yes, this is a point of origin that we recognize. We're probably interested in this cargo. Likewise, if the return address on the box that arrives on your dorm door is from some international country, you don't know anyone in that country, you're not familiar with anyone in that country, that's where this box came from and it has your name on it, no way. I'm not familiar with this point of origin. I don't know where this box came from. That information is foreign to me. I will not be int interested in opening that box. I am not interested in the cargo it contains. And the same is true for the RABs. If the RABs come from a different organelle, a point of origin that is unfamiliar to these tethering proteins, there will not be recognition. There will not be binding. And this vesicle will quite literally bounce off this membrane and keep going throughout the cell. If the point of origin is not known and trusted by the tethering proteins, that vesicle cannot dock here. 
So each membrane type has its own subfamily of RABs, identifying vesicles from that membrane type by their point of origin. So RAB proteins serve as a membrane identifier. RAB proteins tell destination membrane, I am a vesicle made of Golgi membrane. I have come from Golgi. I am a vesicle made from cell membrane. I have come from the cell surface. It gives point of origin. The first step of docking is an interaction between RAB proteins and tethering proteins. This system ensures that only vesicles from appropriate origin organelles fuse with appropriate targets. This recognition and this binding is then stabilized through a second set of proteins called snare proteins. There are vesicle snare proteins called V snares, and then there are membrane snare proteins called M snares, I think, although I might be wrong about that. You don't have to know that yourself. But there are complementary snare proteins, binding snare proteins on the surfaces of both of these membranes. Those snare proteins interact with one another and stabilize the docking process. When RABs and tethering proteins have interacted and the snares have interacted as well, we are fully docked. The vesicle is stably recruited to its target membrane. And so at that point, the vesicle has arrived. But that was just step one. Docking is just half of the story. Eventually these membranes have to fuse so that the contents or cargo of the vesicle can be released into the target. This fusion is also going to result in the vesicle membrane becoming at least temporarily part of the target membrane. Don't lose track of that. <coughs> Excuse me again. What we're saying here is that that fusion not only results in the release of the cargo into the target, but the vesicle membrane quite literally just becomes part of the target membrane. This is also how membrane-bound proteins are delivered. Proteins that are meant to be in the cell membrane are embedded into the ER membrane in mechanisms that we described in the last lecture. Now that cellular membrane protein is stuck to the endoplasmic reticular membrane. But when that portion of the ER membrane buds off, the proteins are still stuck to the now vesicle membrane. And when that vesicle fuses with the cell membrane <coughs> at the cell surface, those proteins are now quite literally embedded in the cell membrane. Because the vesicle membrane became the cell membrane, the ER membrane had become the vesicle membrane. That's how we deliver these proteins. Sometimes after docking fusion is delayed, if a vesicle docks, it can be held in place there, and it can be poised or positioned for fusion, but cellular fusion, I'm um, sorry, membrane fusion can be inhibited or blocked. Then when an appropriate cellular signal is received, Fusion can be triggered, and the contents released. This type of, type of system is especially used for cellular secretion. Many specialized cells secrete specialized molecules, and those molecules are they have some pretty potent physiological effects. Those secretory cells should really only be releasing those molecules when the body, when the organism wants that signal sent. And so oftentimes you'll have vesicle docking, but fusion inhibited, as that secretory cell waits for the signal to secrete and release its signal. This is exactly what we mean here. This is a cellular membrane that we see in this image right here. We have some fusion, so this triangle, this arrow head, is showing a fused membrane. Notice a couple things. When the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, we have now one continuous run of membrane. This is what we mean. The vesicle membrane has become cell membrane. This is all cell membrane here. Here's the point of fusion. This is now cell membrane. A moment ago it was vesicle membrane, but now it is part of the cell. Here we have a vesicle that is docked and just about to fuse. I believe we've actually even begun fusion. But these are all docked vesicles here. They're all docked, poised, ready to be released, ready to fuse with the membrane, but certainly not at the membrane and fusing just yet. What a particular cell releases when that cargo is released is a highly coordinated, highly regulated process. One common example of this process is the release of neurotransmitters by a neuronal cell. Neurotransmitters are molecular signals for electrical impulses. A neuron will make neurotransmitters, store them in vesicles, ship those vesicles to the terminal, the axon terminal of the cell. Those vesicles will dock there at the axon terminal, 
and wait for the signal for fusion. Wait for fusion at that point. So membrane fusion requires docking, but it also requires the vesicle and the target membranes to come much closer in contact. These vesicles, as I just said, are all docked, but they are not yet ready for fusion. For fusion to occur, this vesicle needs to be brought right up to and adjacent to the cell membrane. So how that occurs is also through the snares. The snares interact, and that's fine. That allows this docking to occur. But then once the signal for fusion occurs, the protein coat is shed, and these snares, they twist. Imagine what's going to happen as that occurs. You twist these snares, you twist them up. That winches or tightens the distance between the vesicle and the membrane until eventually they touch. And once, once those two membranes touch, that is fusion. Like two bubbles that touch and then join to form one larger bubble. The vesicle membrane touches the destination membrane. Those membranes become one, and we have fusion and release. So what we've just pretty much described is a secretory pathway, but let's delve a little deeper. Let's talk a little bit more directly about how proteins are secreted by the cell. Newly made proteins, as well as lipids and sugars, can be and constantly are delivered directly to the cell membrane and the extracellular space by vesicles. These molecules come from the ER. They then go to the Golgi, where they're processed and then eventually released to the cell membrane or out of the cell. This is the process of exocytosis, things leaving the cell through membranes. Again, just as we saw, we've made a membrane-bound vesicle. This vesicle has a lipid bilayer membrane. It contains cargo. This cargo is in here because it had the right transport signals to be bound to cargo receptors, which we don't see. Those cargo receptors were bound by and sequestered by adaptins. Those adaptins allowed it a clathrin coat to form around this vesicle, and then this vesicle was shipped, walking along microtubules by walking proteins, to its final destination. Its final destination, in this sense, is the cellular membrane. Once arriving, Rab proteins on this vesicle met up with tethering proteins in the cellular membrane, more specifically in the cytosolic face of the cellular membrane. That started the docking process. Then snare proteins interacted between these two membranes. When the signal for fusion occurred, those snare proteins tightened and winched this vesicle in to the cellular membrane until the two touched. And as soon as they touched, they fused. As soon as they fused, they became one contiguous membrane, and the contents of that vesicle were released into the extracellular space. Exocytosis is the process of vesicle fusion at the cell membrane. And although we're familiar with these steps now, over what we've talked about in this lecture and the one before. We're going to take some time now to kind of talk about this as one cohesive story. Interestingly, and what we've kind of shirked on here a little bit, is as cargo within these vesicles transits from one stage of its journey to another, it is constantly modified and more importantly checked for damage and in the specific case of proteins for unfolding to make sure that none of that has happened. So we have quality control as we go through this, as our cargo transits along its pathway to completion and final destination, it is constantly monitored for leaks, for damage, for anything at all that should take it out of that pathway and recycle it back for that problem to be fixed. Any cargo deemed unacceptable, which believe it or not is the majority of things being shipped, and the cell doesn't mess around. The cell has a high level of quality control that it adheres to, and anything not making the cut is sent back up the chain, it's routed to endosomes, routed then to lysosomes, and degraded and recycled so that it can try again. So let's begin once again at the ER. We've made a protein at the ER, we've threaded it through the ER membrane, it is in the ER lumen, and that protein will be changed before it leaves. Most proteins made at the ER are chemically modified before they leave. One of the most common types of modifications that occurs in the ER is called glycosylation. We've already mentioned glycoproteins a few times. Glycoproteins are proteins that contain sugar groups as well, and the process of glycosylation is the addition of sugars to a protein molecule. 
Glycosylation is, a, is catalyzed by glycosylating enzymes, and these glycosylating enzymes are present in the interior of the ER. They are not found in the cytosol. Glycosylating enzymes in the ER lumen turn proteins that have been fed into the ER into glycoproteins by adding sugar groups to them. These are typically referred to as sugar trees because these sugar groups are not linear polymers that we're familiar with. They're not linear chains of nucleotides like DNA or RNA. They're not linear chains of amino acids like protein. They are branched structures of sugars, so they look more like trees than chains. Here we have our protein being fed into the ER. We're familiar with all this from our last lecture, I hope. This is the threading mechanism of uh, protein synthesis at the ER. This protein is completely threaded into the ER, and then when the appropriate amino acids are found in the ER lumen, glycosylating enzymes take sugar trees and link them onto those ER proteins. And as we said before in our last lecture, most membrane-bound and secreted proteins are glycoproteins. We talked a little bit about lectins, proteins that bind to glycoproteins. We talked quite extensively about the carbohydrate layer, this shocking surprise that even our own cells have a rudimentary cell wall around them made up of sugars. Membrane-bound proteins are made in the ER. Secreted proteins are made in the ER. Membrane-bound and secreted proteins are converted into glycoproteins in the ER through glycosylation. There are no glycoproteins in the cytosol because proteins that remain in the cytosol never go through the ER and glycosylating enzymes are only present in the ER. So any protein that goes through the ER will be glycosylated, most likely. You know, any protein that stays out of the ER cannot be glycosylated. Interestingly, in the ER lumen itself, there's only a small sugar tree. And so every single glycosylated protein in the ER lumen gets the same small sugar tree added to it. Every protein gets the same exact tree. This is almost like a starter tree, like the little tiny evergreen you can buy right after Christmas to plant in your own yard, and in one year's time it's going to grow into a full-grown Christmas tree. It's just the little tree you start with. You can add more and more sugars to that tree, different sugars, added in different ways, and you can increase and enhance that tree. You can create a wide range of different sugar trees in this way, and these modifications primarily occur in the Golgi. So you can make almost any sugar tree you want. There's all types of different glycoproteins out there. But that starter tree, that one tree that they all have in common, here, 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 was added in the ER lumen. And then that tree was expanded with further, further modifications. In order to leave the ER, we have to meet some type of quality check. We have to adhere to some quality control. In order to leave somewhere, we need to be checked first. That sounds pretty familiar. Remember, messenger RNAs were capped, tailed, and spliced, and each of those processes was marked by a protein, and mRNAs that didn't undergo all three modifications could not leave the nucleus. <coughs> Excuse me. So leaving the nucleus was actually a quality control check. Any messenger RNA failing to meet that quality control was kept in the nucleus. Only those messenger RNAs that were correctly processed left the nucleus for translation. That's a constant theme in cellular biology. Only the proper, correctly monitored molecules leaving their point of origin, going to where they're intended to go. Perfect, perfect opportunity for quality control. Some proteins are made in the ER, and they're supposed to live in the ER. Some proteins are ER proteins and shouldn't be shipped anywhere. These proteins have a four amino acid chain that is an ER retention signal. Pretty obvious what that does, I think. Retains those proteins in the ER. Blocks them from being shipped anywhere. These proteins never make it into vesicles, and they spend their entire life in the ER, intentionally so, doing ER functions, catalyzing ER reactions doing things that need to happen in the ER. The glycosylating enzymes are a perfect example. Glycosylating enzymes have ER retention signals. They belong in the ER. They're made there and they stay there. Most proteins made in the ER are not for the ER. They're destined to go to other places. They do not have ER retention signals. 
They instead have transport signals. They instead are captured by adaptants. They instead are packaged into transport vesicles, and they go to the Golgi. Proteins that are incorrectly folded, or proteins that are not in their proper three-dimensional shape, or proteins that are meant to be subunits in a larger multi-protein complex, but fail to get along with the other proteins in that complex, fail to interact appropriately with those partners, fail to become part of that complex, all those proteins are bound by another class called chaperone proteins. Chaperone proteins typically help unfolded proteins fold properly. Chaperone proteins can be thought of, thought of as folding proteins, proteins that fold other proteins. Proteins that try to get other proteins to, quote-unquote, behave the right way, be the right thing, take the right shape. That's why they're given the name chaperones, to oversee. Proteins that are bound to chaperones are bound to chaperones because they haven't yet behaved. They haven't yet folded into the right three-dimensional shape. If they were in the right shape, the chaperones would let them go. So any protein that is bound by a chaperone is still in the process of being folded. So... Any protein bound by the chaperone can't leave the ER because it's not correctly folded yet. You either fold it correctly and you can leave, or you're not folded correctly and the chaperone is there keeping you in the ER. Any protein that remains bound to chaperones for too long is indicating itself to be a real pain in the rear, a very stubborn protein that does not want to fold into its correct shape. Those proteins are forsaken. It's an indication that they'll never fold correctly if they don't follow the folding properties of the chaperones. And so these proteins become targeted for destruction. So we have two scenarios here. We can have a normal protein, of course, actually. That's a third scenario, I guess. Normal protein is made, it folded up properly on its own, and out the ER it goes. We can have a damaged protein that is improperly folded, and the chaperone binds to it. The chaperone kind of nudges it and massages it and squeezes it and finally gets it into the right shape. The right shape means the right function, and so that's now a normal protein, and it's free to leave the ER. Or we have a damaged protein, and the chaperone binds it, nudges it, massages it, nothing happens. Tweaks it and pulls on it, nothing happens. And this protein never takes the right shape. If it never takes the right shape, it'll never have the right function. If it doesn't have the right function, it is tagged for destruction. And it is destroyed by cellular uh, enzymes that degrade proteins. Interestingly, to give this some clinical re re relevance, cystic fibrosis is the result of the process we've just described actually going too far, being a little bit too stingy on its quality control. The mutation that causes cystic fibrosis is often fatal. It results in horrible respiratory issues. This is a mutation in a cell membrane protein, actually a chloride ion, ion channel to be exact. And the mutation in this chloride ion channel causes that channel to misfold properly. It doesn't quite fold into the right shape. Surprisingly, the protein, the chloride channel, folds well enough to do its job. So it still functions as a chloride channel. Actually, if this mutant protein were in the membrane of the individual, they would be asymptomatic. It's completely functional, but slightly misfolded. The problem is this chloride channel is never left alone. It is never allowed to go to the cell membrane. Instead, this minor misfolding is recognized by chaperones in the ER. And so this mutant protein is retained in the ER. The protein never folds into the right shape, so it's constantly being destroyed because of this misfolding. The protein could work if it ever made it to the cell membrane, but it never makes it there because of this quality control system. If the ER... And those chaperone, chaperone proteins pretty much left well enough alone and allowed this chloride channel to make it to its final destination, there would be no cystic fibrosis. But I can't say it enough to you guys. Cells are programmed machines. They are, like programmed machines, stupid. The program is if you are misfolded, you bind to a chaperone. If you bind for, to a chaperone for too long, you're targeted for destruction, period. End of story. So even though this chloride channel would be functional, it's never even given the chance because the program says to target it for destruction. What a shame in a way. 
that the mutation in this chloride channel itself doesn't cause the disease. The mutation tells the cell to destroy the protein, and it's the absence of that protein due to an intentional cellular destruction that causes cystic fibrosis. All right, so we've made it out of the ER. Now what? Well, now things go to the Golgi. We've talked a little bit about it, but keep in mind, we have form a clathrin-coated pit at the ER. Our adaptins are there. They bind to the right cargo receptors. The cargo receptors are binding to the right proteins. Those proteins are packaged into the vesicle. The vesicle pinches off. It makes its way over to the Golgi. Rab and tethering proteins interact. Snares interact. We shed our protein coat. We fuse. And then we dump everything from the ER into the Golgi. The Golgi is really nothing more than a membrane-based organelle. It's made up of nothing more than stacks, flattened stacks of membrane, stacked up upon each other. The Golgi is ridiculously complex, however. It has, first off, two distinct sides or faces to it. The entry side, that is where things and cargo proteins arrive at the Golgi, is referred to as its cis face. And this face faces the ER. That's where most of the material comes from that enters the Golgi, is from the ER. So the very beginning or entry point of the ER is called the cis side. The exit portion of the Golgi, the opposite end of the Golgi, is called the trans face. And this is where cargo leaves the Golgi off to wherever it's going, the lysosome, the cell membrane, etc. So here's the trans side, where things leave the Golgi. And then in between, we have all of these flattened membrane stacks. These stacks are called cisterna, pl singular, cisterna for plural. The outermost membrane stacks of the Golgi, this is the Golgi stacks closest to the trans face, is connected to a network of membrane tubes which serve as the exit portal of the Golgi. So here is the trans face, this is where everything leaves the Golgi. You can see these kind of tubes, all these budding vesicles, things ready to leave. The trans cisterna is the flattened membrane stack just in front of this exit structure. This is where vesicles leave the Golgi, butt off, and take fully processed material with them. Proteins and, of course, membrane from the endoplasmic reticulum come to the cis face, the entry point of the Golgi, and fuse there via transport vesicles. These proteins, the cargo of those vesicles, then travel stepwise from stack to stack in vesicles being constantly modified and monitored along the way. So things come in from the ER to the Golgi and then at that cis face they get funneled and transported further through and further into the Golgi. Each time we're going to leave the Golgi for one cisterna to another those cargo molecules move through vesicles. In order to get into the vesicle, there's a quality control point to make sure no damage or unfolding has occurred. So material arrives to the cis face. Once in the cis face, it buds off into its own intragology vesicle, and this vesicle is going to fuse with the next cisterna. There's going to be some modifications in there, some changes. And then before we can be packaged into the next vesicle, we're checked for quality. Make sure there's no damage. Quality passes, no damage. We butt off a new vesicle. That vesicle just moves forward one cisterna to the next. Fuses there, dumps the cargo into that flattened stack. More modifications occur there. Lastly, one more vesicle budding. Make sure nothing happened, no damage. And then we fuse with the trans face for final exit from the Golgi. Vesicles leave the trans face and they head outwards, usually towards either the cell membrane if all quality controls were passed, or to the lysosome for recycling if there was a failure of quality control. The Golgi is really an assembly line. It is nothing more than an assembly line approach to protein modification. A change is made to a protein. That protein is checked, made sure nothing was damaged, no problem. If the change occurred properly and there was no damage incurred, that protein then moves to the next cisterna the next stage of modification. There, something else is done. Something else is added. You add that thing, you make sure it was added properly. You check, did I damage anything? Did I scratch anything? Did I hurt this spike? No? Okay. Ship that protein via vesicle to the next cisterna. Now, something else is going to be done. A new thing is done there. Step three, change that. Check it. Was it done right? Yes. Any damage? No. 
package that into a vesicle, send it to the next cisterna. True, stepwise, mechanistic assembly line approach to protein modification. Where a particular Golgi enzyme is found, these are enzymes or proteins that catalyze these changes. Where in the Golgi that enzyme is found, the stack that it is in, is closely related to when that reaction occurs. In other words, enzymes which add early modifications to new proteins are found near the cis face early on in the pathway in the assembly line of these protein modifications. Conversely, enzymes that put on the final touches to these processed proteins are going to be found most close to the trans cisterna, closest to the end of the line where the proteins are almost leaving. While this makes complete logical sense to think of it this way, take a moment and realize what we're saying. The Golgi is an assembly line. We have a factory assembly line in every single one of our cells. That's insane to me. Something that Henry Ford devised about 150, maybe 200 years ago. This idea of a stepwise, mechanistic approach. Start with something very amorphous. Do one step to make that a car, and then move that thing to the next stage, and then move that to the next stage. Each step is a different place on the assembly line. That thing that has occurred to us in the last 200 years, the cell evolved already. It's insane. The Golgi is an assembly line. It is structured exactly like an assembly line is structured. Got to be kidding me. One of the many things that happens in the Golgi is the expansion of the sugar tree that was started in the ER. Remember, in the ER, we only added this small little starter tree. This tree is made protein-specific. It's expanded, and different sugars are added to it. Different branches are added to it. That whole huge sugar tree, that's finished in the Golgi. But that's only one thing that the Golgi does. The Golgi does a lot of other things, too. All right, so we've gone through the ER, and we've gone through the Golgi. Sounds like we're pretty close to being ready to exit the cell. So, in all of our cells, there's a constant stream of vesicles leaving the Golgi and fusing with the cell membrane. There's a constant stream of cellular secretion. This is a constant process that occurs in an ongoing way for the entire life of a cell. Because of this, this pathway is referred to as the constitutive exocytosis pathway. Constitutive meaning not regulated, never turned off, always on. Exocytosis meaning things leaving the cell. So we have this constant flow of stuff, molecules, sometimes waste, mostly protein, being made at the Golgi, modified in the Golgi, I should say, butting off the Golgi, transporting to the cell membrane, fusing at the cell membrane, and being dumped into the extracellular space. This constitutive exocytosis pathway, most importantly, more than the molecules being secreted, provides a constant supply of new membrane for the cell membrane, allowing the cell membrane to grow. Maybe more importantly, something we'll come to at the very end of the lecture, allow the cell membrane not to shrink. And that's the point. The cell membrane needs to constantly be replenished. And the constant replenishment of cell membrane happens by this exocytosis pathway. And given enough new membrane at the uh, cell, the cell does grow. It grows to a sufficient size that it can divide, and this governs mitosis and cytokinesis as well. But that's the cellular membrane side. What about all the secretion? Well, some of the secreted proteins actually stay on the exterior face of the cellular membrane, and there they behave as peripheral proteins. They're bound to the membrane, but not embedded in the membrane. That's true of some proteins, but not many. Some proteins become part of the ECM, the extracellular matrix. The ECM is very, very important, and we're just going to have to hang our hat on that for a couple more weeks. Uh, I believe it's the very last lecture, or the second to last lecture, where we talk in some detail about the ECM. But most of those proteins either leave the cell entirely, and go on to signal and or nourish other cells. Most efficiently, they do this by diffusing into the bloodstream, and then the bloodstream carries them throughout the cell. We'll talk about hormones that do this at least in our next lecture of cellular signaling. And then, of course, some of those proteins are membrane-bound, and they arrive at the cell membrane and stay stuck in the cell membrane. 
So that's the, ex the constitutive pathway. There's also a regulated exocytosis pathway. The regulated exocytosis pathway behaves very much the same in principle, except docking and fusion are most definitely delineated. Things are made at the Golgi, shipped to the cell membrane where docking occurs, but fusion does not occur until a cellular signal is received and processed, which triggers that fusion. This regulated pathway is unique and specialized only for secretory cells, cells that specifically secrete specific molecules for specific reasons. Examples are cells that make hormones, cells that make digestive enzymes, cells that make things like insulin, even cells that create mucus, secrete mucus in this way in a regulated fashion. Cells that fall into this secretory class secrete molecules by the gallonful. These cells are constantly secreting things. The molecules to be secreted are made in the Golgi, or again, I misspeak yet again, processed by the Golgi, secreted or bud from the Golgi. They are made in more specialized secretory vesicles, which have some additional proteins on their cell membrane. These target these vesicles for rapid transport to the cell membrane, and they also inhibit fusion. So these secretory vesicles are specialized to be quickly sent to the cell membrane, but also stopped from fusing. So once these vesicles arrive at the cell membrane, they dock, but they don't fuse. They wait there, poised, for a particular cellular cue. Usually this cue is received from outside the cell. It's usually an extracellular signal that is transmitted into the cell. And then once that signal is properly received, vesicle fusion is triggered, the vesicle fuses with the cell membrane, and its contents are dumped into the extracellular space. This beautiful, beautiful electron micrograph shows this. This is a pancreatic cell that has made insulin. It's a secretory cell. It makes tons of insulin all the time. And that insulin is made and poised at the cell membrane in secretory vesicles. However, we don't want to always be releasing insulin, do we? Insulin takes glucose out of the blood, so we only want to release insulin when blood glucose levels are high. So these vesicles are sent to and dock with the cell membrane, but they do not fuse until the, cel the cellular cue for high blood glucose levels is received. Once that cue is received by the cell, the cell realizes that there's high levels of glucose in the blood. We have fusion. Fusion releases this insulin particle into the extracellular environment. It will diffuse to the blood. In the blood, that insulin will trigger other cells to take glucose out of the blood, and blood glucose levels are remaining constant. Also note, as though we've, we've already said it before, when this fusion occurs, the vesicle membrane, here is the former membrane of the vesicle right here, you can see the vesicle membrane here. The vesicle membrane is now cell membrane. We trace the cell membrane. We come all the way around. Here it is, cell membrane. <coughs> Excuse me. But the cell membrane usually doesn't grow much due to endocytosis, uh, due to exocytosis. And that's because endocytosis is occurring simultaneously. We'll come back to endocytosis, as I said, at the very end of the lecture, in just a couple minutes, actually. But I can uh, analogize this to a monorail system. For those of you who've done a lot of air travel, or even those of you who've just done some, oftentimes in very big airports, there's a monorail that brings you from the parking garage to the terminal. Now, what does this monorail do? It, it takes people from the parking lot and brings them to the terminal. If you were an outside spectator, you'd say, wow, that monorail keeps bringing these people into the airport. The airport's going to get so full of people soon that no one's going to have anywhere to move. No one's going to have anywhere to be. The airport's going to get so crowded. What's going to happen? This is the idea of exocytosis. So many vesicles are going to the cell membrane. My God, that pancreatic cell is going to swell and burst. How can a cell have so much membrane on it? What's going to happen? Well, that's not an issue, because every time the monorail drops people off from the parking lot to the terminal, what does it then do? It grabs people from the terminal and brings them back to the parking lot. The airport never gets crowded, because there's a constant stream of people from the parking lot to the terminal, and from the terminal back to the parking lot. So the number of people in the airport stays roughly the same. 
It's just the people keep getting cycled. That is the balance between endocytosis and exocytosis. Yes, exocytosis is constantly adding new membrane to the cell. But endocytosis is constantly taking membrane away from the cell also, keeping the overall volume of the cell relatively constant. So let's wrap up with some endocytosis. Our cells, while they are constantly secreting things into their extracellular environment, are also constantly taking molecules in from that environment. This most often includes fluids as well as small molecules, but also some large molecules and some large structures as well can be taken in. Like the vesicles we've already discussed, just moving in reverse, the cellular membrane invaginates through clathrin, buds inwards, captures stuff through receptors from the outside of the cell, pinches off, becomes a vesicle inside the cell, and then migrates inward. Same idea as before, except the pinching off is occurring at the cell membrane, and so what we're gathering is cargo, is stuff from the extracellular space. This is an endocytic vesicle a vesicle that was formed by endocytosis. The contents of this vesicle are eventually going to make it to the lysosome. where They will be degraded. Those contents, those molecules, will be digested down into their basic building blocks. Those building blocks will then be released by the lysosome into the cytoplasm of the cell, and those building blocks will be used to do things, to make things that the cell needs. There are two general forms of endocytosis, phagocytosis and pinocytosis. Pinocytosis is the smaller form of cytosis, is where smaller molecules and liquids, fluids, are taken in by the pinching in of the cell membrane. So truly, like the diagram I showed before, the cell membrane is invaginated by clathrin, and this creates a vesicle, penocytosis. All cells do this type of endocytosis, and again, it's for smaller molecules. The other form of endocytosis that we will not discuss in any detail is phagocytosis. Phagocytosis is for larger things. This is cellular engulfment. This is for large particles, very large molecules, even small organisms like bacteria can be consumed in this way. This is when the cell actually projects what are almost like pseudopods out of itself. The cell membrane reaches out and surrounds something and then forms a vesicle out there and brings that in. There's a pretty creepy diagram in your book, an electron micrograph in your book, if you'd like to see that. But we're going to talk about penocytosis for the rest of this lecture. So the cell membrane is constantly in motion. There's always new secretory vesicles coming in from the Golgi and fusing with the cell membrane. Constant, constant replenishment of membrane. Tons and tons of material being released into the extracellular space. But simultaneously, there's tons and tons of endocytosis with vesicles being pinched off from that cellular membrane and then traveling inward. An actively endocytosing cell, a cell that does a lot of endocytosis, like a macrophage cell, a, a scavenger cell from your immune system, removes about 3% of its total cellular membrane every minute. Think of that. In about 30 minutes, 99% of its cellular membrane has been brought in. That means in, an, in a half an hour, the cell has engulfed or vesicalized about 100% of its membrane. So does that mean the cell's gone? That it basically ate itself? No, of course not. Because all that time, we were dumping vesicle membrane, yeah, we were dumping membrane from vesicles off at the cell membrane. Back to our monorail analogy. If there were 100 people in the airport, and the monorail brought those 100 people back to the parking garage in one hour's time, would you say the airport was empty? No, because every time the monorail went to the airport to get more of those 100 people, it was bringing people from the parking lot to the terminal. So for every 10 people that were brought out of the terminal, another 10 were brought in, and there's still 100 people in the terminal. It's just that now they're all different. So all this time, with all this penocytosis, secretory vesicles have been fusing with the cellular membrane, keeping it from changing, keeping it the same size. Most penocytosis occurs via clathrin-coated pits, as we described earlier in the lecture. Most of these are forming clathrin-coated vesicles, as we've described them. Same thing happens. We have receptors in the cell membrane that bind to specific cargo. Those receptors are captured by adaptins, and those specific cargo molecules brought into the cell. Exactly 
as we've described earlier. Pinocytosis can be indiscriminate. It Just the invagination of the cellular membrane and the closing of some extracellular material around that does trap any and all molecules that happen to be in that vicinity. And in fact, one of the processes that's involved in endocytosis is sorting getting the things we wanted from that penocytosis pathway and separating it from all the crap we got that we didn't want because that stuff happened to be in the vesicle as it formed. Usually the stuff that the vesicle captures indiscriminately is not things that the cell needs or wants. Many times, more specifically, there are specific protein receptors in the cell membrane that are trapped in these clathrin-coated pits by adaptins, and these protein receptors specifically bind to things that the cell needs and wants. These desired molecules bind to the receptors, and that concentrates those molecules in that region of the cell membrane. Now, when that cell membrane buds and forms a vesicle, those molecules are captured in that vesicle. The desired molecules enter the cell as a receptor molecule complex. Those desired molecules stuck to their receptors are embedded in the, in the vesicle. And so the vesicle brings them inside the cell. This is called, for obvious reasons, receptor-mediated endocytosis, or RME. Endocytosis that's occurring through receptors to assure that the cargo being brought into the cell is wanted cargo. Here's how it works in one big picture. We have our receptors in the cell membrane, pointing outwards to the extracellular space. Some molecule that the cell wants binds specifically to this receptor. These molecules could be cholesterol, for example, some vitamin that the cell needs, etc. That molecule that the cell wants binds to its receptor. The receptor is then captured by adaptins, which are not shown on this diagram. Clathrin forms around those adaptins, creating the clathrin-coated pit. That membrane in that region invaginates inward, eventually closing in on itself. Dynamin is going to squeeze that neck and pinch off that vesicle. This is endocytosis. That vesicle then enters the cell. It eventually fuses with endosomes and lysosomes. We'll talk about the rest of this in just a second, but our wanted cargo is, continues its journey into the cell, and the receptors are recycled back out to the cell membrane, where the process can repeat. The cell membrane fuses, the vesicle membrane fuses with the cell membrane. The receptors are still embedded in that vesicle. Once that fusion occurs, the receptors become part of the cell membrane again, and we're ready to bind our next round of cargo. This is the way that cells get cholesterol inside of themselves to allow for membrane stiffening, which we've discussed already. Iron is brought into the cell this way, as is the vitamin B12. Interestingly, and a little bit freaky, viruses also get into cells using this pathway, but it's a hijacking of this pathway. Viruses fool some of those native natural receptors into thinking that the virus is something that it's not, into thinking that the virus is something the cell wants. So the virus binds to the receptor, clathrin-coated pit brings the virus intentionally into the cell. And then once the virus is in the cell, it can launch its infection. So by exploiting this pathway, viruses get entry. The HIV virus, as well as the influenza virus, actually gets into cells through the receptor-mediated endocytic pathway. So it's this wonderful, wonderful pathway of getting things into the cell that also has this spooky side note of a facilitating viral infection. Once that fully budded vesicle is inside the cell, as I mentioned before, it's going to fuse with an endosome. Among other things, endosomes are, like their lysosome counterparts, quite acidic, and that low pH in the endosome is enough to break the interactions between the cargo and its receptor. Uh, we've encountered something like this before in our lab. My apologies to Lizeth and Nikki. But in lab, we used a change in pH to create a um, disintegration of the interaction between our DNA and our gene clean resin. You might remember that. We cleaned our DNA resin complexes. We did a bunch of washes there, and then we added TE. And I told you guys that when you add the TE, you change the pH. When you change the pH, you change the charge. 
And when you change the charge, the DNA lets go of that resin, and now the DNA has been eluded. Changes in pHs often interfere with molecules interacting with each other, and this change to an acidic pH in the endosome causes cargo to let go of the receptor. At this point, the endosome splits itself into two. The empty receptors recycle back to the cell membrane to repeat the process. The endosome containing the released endocytized molecules, the cargo we were after in the first place, eventually fuse with lysosomes. So the digestion occurs, sorting occurs, and the wanted materials that were endocytized on purpose are used by the cell, released into the cytoplasm, and used for cellular processes. Different receptors carrying different cargo do take different routes. That is to say, cholesterol gets into the cell a little bit differently. Cholesterol doesn't really go directly to lysosomes. Iron as well usually doesn't go through the lysosome step, but that's a level of detail that we are just not going to touch in this course. That's more of a graduate level of detail that you may get to potentially later if you choose to go that route. All we're interested in is getting specific cargo into the cell through clathrin-coated pits, fusing with endosomes to release that cargo, and then the receptors go one way back to the cell membrane, the cargo migrates further into the cell where it can be used. And that's what this diagram shows here. We have our recycling back to the cell membrane, we have our degradation into lysosomes, or we can move to some other part of the cell and do some other cellular function there. So what did we talk about in this lecture? We started off pretty basic, started off right where we left off in the last lecture, saying that, sure, proteins move around in cells by threading through membranes, but that's not the only part of the story. Transport throughout all the members of the endomembrane system is carried out by the budding and fusion of transport vesicles. And we characterize these as two different pathways, eating things, bringing things in from the outside, or endocytosis, and secreting things, sending things to the outside, uh, which is exocytosis. We then moved on to this idea of coded vesicles. Most vesicles are actually covered in a unique protein coat. We use clathrin as our primary example of this. At the cell membrane for endocytosis, vesicles start off as clathrin-coated pits. Dynamin is used to restrict that vesicle and eventually pinch it off, forming it to, uh, causing it to be released. Adaptins play a much larger role, though. They are used both for cargo selection, trapping and capturing these cargo receptors below the neck of the budding vesicle, as well as targeting that vesicle for its final destination. Once at its final destination, vesicles are recognized by tethering proteins on the surface of the destination membrane. Rab proteins on the vesicle itself serve as routing signals, as return address labels, telling the target where that vesicle came from. And then if the tethering proteins are quote-unquote interested in that Rab protein, you get an interaction, and the beginnings of docking have occurred. Additional recognition and a stabilization of docking occurs through snare proteins that are on both the vesicle and the target membrane. And snare proteins are also involved in fusion by twisting or winching in the vesicle. We then switched gears a little bit and talked about what happens in the ER. We came back full circle and told the whole story of protein migration through the endomembrane system starting in the ER. And we put some more meat on that skeleton by talking about the primary modification that happens in the ER, glycosylation, which is the addition of sugars to a protein, making it a glycoprotein. And we talked a little bit about that starter tree. We also told the story of cystic fibrosis and chaperone protein. Chaperone proteins bind to proteins that are damaged, incorrectly folded, or not participating in their intended complex. And chaperone binding sequesters proteins in the ER. Proteins can't leave the ER unless they are released by chaperones. Proteins that are bound by chaperones for too long are actually targeted for destruction. Once you do get to leave the ER, however, you go to the Golgi. And we talked a little bit about the amazing organization of the Golgi, the cis face, the trans face, getting from cisternae, cisternae to cisternae with uh, vesicles, and this assembly line approach to protein modification. We wrapped up the lecture with a brief description of the constitutive exocytosis pathway, then a little bit more detail on the regulated exocytosis pathway, and just a moment ago we wrapped all of that up by talking about receptor-mediated endocytosis and how this is used to get specific cargo into the cell, specifically 
and also used as a sorting mechanism to try to minimize the amount of unwanted junk that can get into a vesicle. So that's it for this chapter. We will be moving on to the next chapter. I don't have my textbook in front of me. I think that's chapter 16, although I'm not sure. It's definitely it's the cellular communications chapter. We're breaking that chapter up into two lectures as well. And the next two lecture series will be the end for this unit. So two more lectures, and we're done with unit three for the course.